Bernie Sack, and I'm Mira Shearer, and we are interviewing Mr. Mike Blaine for our Holocaust Memorial Project. And thank you for coming and telling us your difficult story. Where were you born? Uh, it's very complicated. Uh, I like to say I was born in uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, the Soviet Union, and the Ukraine. And uh, I'll explain the uh, place where I was born. And when I was born was Czechoslovakia. And uh, during World War II, the Hungarians occupied my area. And after uh, the war in 1945, the Soviet Union took that area. And now it's in the Ukraine. So what the joke is that uh, I, my parents were born in Austria-Hungary. I was born in Czechoslovakia. In Hungary, I lived in the Soviet Union, and then in Ukraine, and I never left my village. It was always the same, same village. And where were you when World War II started? When wor World War II started, mm -hmm. I was uh, home in my village. I was uh, 11 years old, a little younger than you are, I think. Um, in in uh, March of 1939, the Hungarians occupied my territory, and I was there. So it first affected your life? Pardon? Did your family's life change in the same way that yours did? Could you repeat that again? Did your family's life change in the same way that yours did? Well, uh, <coughs> did my family's life change the way mine changed? Is that the question? Uh, well, first of all, my father was uh, arrested and taken to a labor camp. And uh, one of my brothers and brother in laws were also taken to a labor camp. Uh, <laughs> My life changed because uh, until 1939, I attended Czech language school. And once the Hungarians took over, uh, I uh, had to switch to Ruthenian school and later to Hungarian school. So by the time uh, I was your age, I uh, attended uh, Hebrew school, uh, Czech language school, uh, Ukrainian and Hungarian schools. And I had to learn four different languages by the time I was your age. Um, were you sent to a camp? Which camp were you sent to? <coughs> Which? Um, concentration camp. Me? Yeah. I was very lucky. I was, uh, I, uh, let me explain. Uh, when the war broke out, uh, I was one of <coughs> seven siblings. One of my sisters was married and she had three children of her own. So the seven siblings and the three children and her husband and uh, my parents together, we were uh, 13, 13 people just in my immediate family. After the war, of the 13, only three of us survived. Uh, my sister, who was uh, still a teenager, left, uh, uh, left home, went to Belgium to work. There was nothing to do in our village, so when uh, children finished uh, their elementary school, they had to do something else, so she went to Belgium. And when the Germans uh, invaded Belgium, and she escaped to France, and from her, the Germans followed her to France, and from France she escaped to southern France, which was uh, governed by a Vichy uh, government, a different government. And from there, in 1942, uh, she managed to come to the United States with one, one of the last votes. My brother survived, uh, was taken to Auschwitz with my, the rest of my family, and uh, he was separated from my family. My, um, 
rest of my family was uh, taken to the gas chambers and uh, gassed and their bodies burned. My brother was uh, young and strong, so they sent him to a number of different labor camps in uh, Germany, and uh, he survived, liber was liberated by, by American troops. Now, I was very lucky because, uh, first of all, I was lucky that the Hungarians uh, occupied my territory because the Hungarians at first did not uh, cooperate with the Germans and uh, started the killing of their Jews. The, uh, well, well uh, all the other European countries that the Germans occupied the first job, the main job, was to kill all the Jews. And, uh, but the Hungarians did not do that until later, uh, in 1944. When I was, uh, I finished my eighth grade education, uh, I was 14 years old, and uh, there was nothing to do in my village, so I left home and I went to Budapest uh, to learn a trade. I was uh, learning to design and uh, make uh, ladies' handbags. And uh, life was uh, fairly normal for the Jews, uh, especially compared to what happened in the other occupied countries. The, uh, in, uh, in March of 1944, when the Nazis and Hitler were very unhappy with the Hungarians that they did not start to exterminate the Jews, sent in uh, German troops. It uh, was headed by a Nazi uh, colonel named Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann, you may recognize the name, was uh, after the war. Uh, tracked to, he was living in Argentina, the Israeli Secret Service arrested him and brought him to Israel and he was tried and executed in Israel. He was uh, the only person ever executed in Israel. Anyway, he came in in 1944 and uh, uh, his main job, his only job was to exterminate all the Hungarian Jews. It was a, a large community, about uh, half a million Jews living there. And as soon as they came, the first thing they had to do is uh, we all had to wear the yellow star. I think I had a picture so here. See, this is show this picture, just to show you that I was young once, <laughs> and I had hair, but mainly uh, because uh, to show you what the star, the yellow star, all the Jews had to wear as soon as uh, uh, the Germans occupied Hungary. And uh, Eichmann was very successful within uh, a few weeks. Uh, all the Jews all over uh, Hungary were arrested, uh, first uh, taken to ghettos, and uh, that's what happened to my family. And my, again, my lucky break was, one of my lucky breaks was I wasn't home when this happened. I was in Budapest, and my family wasn't home. So they were all arrested, uh, taken to the ghetto, and then they waited uh, for their trains, uh, cattle cars, to take them to Auschwitz. They squeezed in as many people, standing room only in cattle cars, and it took, uh, <coughs> they gave them two buckets, uh, one bucket with water, one bucket for, uh, to relieve themselves, and uh, it took two or three days until they arrived in Auschwitz. And uh, by the time they arrived in Auschwitz, half of the people were dead because of the, um, no air and, and starvation and diseases. And as soon as they arrived in Auschwitz, uh, they, there were the Nazis there. 
my brother described to me what happened in the middle of the night and bright lights and dogs and Nazis and screaming, yelling, get out of the car, the cattle cars. Came up and they separated the uh, children and old people to one side and the able-bodied, like my brother, to another side. Uh, my, my mother, my sisters, my little nephews, they were all uh, marched to the uh, gas chambers. They were told to undress and uh, make neat piles of their clothing because they will need it. They will be needed after uh, they come out. They were told they were going to take a shower. Instead, when they were squeezed into the uh, crematorium, into the gas chambers, uh, they locked the doors. A Nazi would go on the roof and drop a canister of gas. It was called Cyclone B gas. And within a minute, most of the people would be dead. Um, a few minutes later, the doors were opened. There were other inmates who would drag out the bodies and, and other inmates who would pull the gold teeth out of the dead bodies. And uh, the people uh, would have to my family. With their, uh, they were cremated and their ashes just thrown away. So that happened to my family and six million other Jews. Meantime, is this the phone? Oh, this is okay? Uh, my, the Nazis came into Hungary in March of 1944. By May, all the Jews in, in the, all of Hungary, were were shipped to death camps. Um, except in Budapest, for some reason, uh, the Jews in Budapest were not immediately uh, taken to, uh, to, to were not deported. One of the reasons was uh, we learned later is that the Nazis wanted to trade uh, Jews for uh, trucks. Uh, Eichmann offered uh, the Allies, uh, the Great Britain and the United States, a million Jews, or whatever Jews were left, for so many trucks to be used in the war effort. Uh, naturally, the British and the Americans uh, turned that down. And uh, we were in Budapest. Uh, I was arrested. And uh, my first job was to clear the rubble from the buildings from the, that were bombed by uh, the Budapest at that time was bombed three times by the Russians in the morning, the British in the afternoon, Americans at night. And there were a lot of destroyed houses. So one, one of my jobs was to clear the rubble and the dead bodies from these buildings. And. Uh, Life was getting a little bit normal for us until uh, 19, uh, in October of 1944, when the Russian army was getting closer uh, to Budapest. Uh, the Hungarian government petitioned the, the Russian army and the Soviet Union to, for peace. The Hungarians realized the war was almost over, and uh, they lost the war, and so they wanted to um, wanted to have a peace agreement with the Soviet Union. Hitler was very upset about that, didn't like it, sent in many more troops to Hungary, arrested the Hungarian government, and deported them to, took them to Germany, and they, uh, they installed their own Hungarian fascist uh, Nazi government. And that's where the rest of us Jews who still remain remaining in Budapest uh, started to uh, uh, begin to suffer. First thing they did is they established a ghetto in, uh, in Budapest. And they tried to squeeze in all the Jews into that small area in the ghetto. I, I was uh, at that time living in a uh, children's home, and they uh, took all the children to the ghetto. Uh, a couple of days later, I managed to escape, 
can go back there. Uh, am I answering your question? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, can I go ahead, please? Yes, please. And uh, I was uh, arrested again and taken to the Russian front, to the Russian German front, where I was there with other ch children and older people. Uh, I was at that time 50 years old. And we were made to dig trenches for the German army. Uh, Anti-tank trenches, personnel trenches. And uh, we were uh, living on a farm, living, if you call it that. We were housed in, the, in, in, in a barn, in a farm. And uh, the Russian army is getting closer and closer with the shooting was unbearable. We could, they're getting very close. So they moved us closer to Budapest. In the meantime, two of my friends, uh, who were just a year older, had escaped. And two days later, they came back uh, in Hungarian army uniforms and with machine guns. They managed to infiltrate the Hungarian uh, underground and get uh, machine guns and the uniform. They came back and they told the Nazis that they have orders to march and they pointed at me and one other kid uh, to march us back to Budapest. And uh, they pretended, of course, that they were uh, Hungarian soldiers. So we marched through uh, back to Budapest and uh, I uh, I always break down at this point because I think of these two young boys who risked their lives to come and save me and one or two other boys. So to, uh, back to the place where we were taken from in Budapest. Uh, we were there till December. 24th, Christmas Eve, and uh, again the Nazis came and arrested all of us and, and started to march us with uh, camps in Austria. And those last few days or a few weeks of the war, the, uh, the Jews who were arrested or were still in the ghetto were being marched to Austria. Austria was not very far from Budapest. And uh, there were no more trucks or trains, so they just marched us. And those people who were uh, who were uh, unable to uh, walk, they were just uh, killed, they were shot, and their bodies thrown into the trenches. And uh, we were marched across uh, Budapest. Is two cities, Buda and Pest, and there is a Danube is uh, dividing, the, and we would cross the Danube with Austria, and when we got there, um, the German um, soldiers with the, on their motorcycles started to come and scream and yell, take them back, take them back. Uh, we, we did not know why, but it, they divided us in two groups. Uh, one of the groups was taken to the Danube, that's the river in Budapest, and they were lined up and there they were machine guns and their bodies thrown into the river. This was a very common occurrence in the last weeks of the war. My group, uh, they didn't know what to do with us, so they took us back to a house where, the house where the Jews were taken away from before. And uh, we were there uh, about a week in that house. And again, uh, Hungarian, Soldiers came into the courtyard and set up machine guns and started screaming, uh, get ready, we're going to march again. And of course, that's what I thought. I thought uh, that would be the end of me, the end of all of us. And they marched us a couple of blocks to another empty house. And then we found out that these uh, Hungarian soldiers were really Jewish young uh, boys who again infiltrated the Hungarian underground and they got 
machine, machine guns and soldiers, and they told us that they would be they would be guiding us until we are liberated. Sixty-four years ago, to January 13, 1945, I was uh, liberated in Budapest by by the Soviet army, the Russian troops. And so today I remember that uh, that occurrence as anniversary of sorts. Uh, of course, uh, when I got home, uh, back to the village, I found that uh, nobody survived. My brother was showed up later, and my sister, of course, was in America already. Have any other questions? Did you have a celebration for the ending of the war? Um, well, we were, of course, overjoyed uh, that the war ended. But um, as, as a child, um, during the war, I was very naive. I uh, thought that once the war has ended, we will have peace and love and uh, no more wars and no more killings and no more anti-Semitism. Um, I soon found out that that's not to be. So the celebration kind of ended, especially uh, there's nothing to celebrate since uh, my family and uh, six million of our people were destroyed, so there was not much to celebrate. Um, did you move? If so, did you move? If so, where? I moved after the war, after I was liberated. Yeah, that's another story. Uh, in uh, 1945, we, the area that I told you was occupied by Hungary and the Soviet Union, I thought will be given back to Czechoslovakia. But when I found out the Soviet Union took over that area, uh, I decided that that was not for me. In the first place, when I came home, I'm sorry to say my Jewish neighbors were not very happy to see me survive. We, uh, they did not expect any Jews to survive, and those who came back were not welcome. Uh, not welcome. So um, I decided that uh, I didn't want to live under the Soviet Union. So five of us friends, uh, young people, I uh, was 17 maybe by then, decided to we'll escape from the Soviet Union into Czechoslovakia. Uh, we, we arrived uh, at the border of the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia. And, uh, we hired two farmers two, who smuggled people across, across the border into Czechoslovakia. Uh, they came for us in two horse and buggies to take us across to the border where they, these, these uh, two men had farms there so they knew the area, they knew when the border guards would uh, be away so we can cross into Czechoslovakia. This was February of 1946, and uh, the snow was this deep. Uh, three of my friends got into the first horse and buggy, and that horse went to the border. And um, a friend of mine and I got into the second, second horse and buggy, and my horse was not much because of the deep snow. And so again, I thought this will be they ended me because I'll be arrested because there were many soldiers going back and forth. Well, exactly the opposite happens. My final, finally, my horse took off and we got to the border and we found out that the first three of my friends were arrested by the Soviet border guards and imprisoned. And while they were taken away, uh, my friend and I managed to get across the border to Czechoslovakia. In uh, Czechoslovakia, I lived uh, uh, 
uh, from February to June of 1946. And uh, in 1946, I found out that the British government invited 1,000 orphaned uh, Holocaust survivor children to go to England. So I signed up for that, and I was uh, one of the lucky ones chosen to, uh, to go to England. Uh, the government allowed uh, a thousand children to be brought to England, but all they could find is just 760 children uh, that uh, managed to get they couldn't find any more uh, survivors, surviving children. So we, uh, I, I was taken by train through Germany and Belgium to France, and we were in France for two weeks, and then we went to London, and uh, we lived there. I lived there till uh, worked and studied in London, in England. I. Uh, in December of 1949, I came to the United States. I uh, joined my sister here in uh, New York. And uh, a year later, I was uh, drafted in the United States Army, and uh, I find myself in Korea fighting another war. <laughs> I was in Korea for two years in the United States Army. I came home. I uh, I enrolled in college. I went to Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, where I got uh, my degree. And I also got a wife there. I found my wife in Rochester, New York. Uh, we now have, uh, we had three sons, 12 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. And that's almost the rest of my story. Any other questions? I'm wondering if anybody here has a question. Anyone has a question? Come on. Yes, right. How do you feel like when people, radicals, are saying that the Holocaust never happened? It uh, makes me very sad and very angry. In fact, uh, I speak uh, to uh, schools and churches, and when I end my presentation, I asked, do you believe what I just told you? And they said, of course they believe me. I said, well, there are people who say it never happened. And uh, it makes me very, very angry and very upset that uh, that's what people can say it never happened. And one of the worst uh, Holocaust deniers is the uh, president of Iran. I can't pronounce his name. Haram yeah. He, uh, he had the chutzpah to call a uh, conference in, in Tehran of Holocaust deniers. And uh, he had a, uh, a cartoon competition making fun of the Holocaust. And uh, again, makes me very, very angry. Um, I was wondering if you still have your yellow star. The, the original one? No. I don't. See, at first it was, uh, we were so anxious to get rid of everything that it reminded us of what happened. Mm -hmm. But I should have said it. Yeah. Um, how come you weren't, when you went back to your village, how come you weren't welcome there? How come? How come you weren't welcome there? Because the people were very anti-Semitic. Um, Mike, when you were telling the story, you said that the Jews did not welcome you back. Oh, no. no. I, oh. Right. Non-Jews, you meant you were non-Jews. Oh, non-Jews, right. Oh, did I say that? Oh, that's um, terrible. That's non-Jews. Non non okay. First of all, there was no, I was the first one to return to the village. There were no other Jews when I returned after the war. Uh, my brother uh, was liberated uh, like in May 
in Germany when American troops and he came home in June. But uh, no, the non-Jews, neighbors and friends and neighbors uh, are the ones who did not welcome me. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. He was asking, he was asking why. There were no Jews to welcome me. It was interesting, why is that like this? Well, the others was curious, why is that? Why? Why they were attacked? First of all, uh, when I came back to the village, uh, I found our house, only the walls were still standing. Everything, what they could, our neighbors could steal, they stole, including windows and doors and furniture, everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, when uh, one of my neighbors told me that so and so has your furniture, I went to see this woman. I said, I'd like to have it back. And she told me, I will, I will chop it up, chop it up for fire with it. I'm not going to give it back to you. This is the kind of reception I had. But we had a, uh, my mother had a sewing machine. It was, uh, it was already an antique then. It was a, uh, no, we didn't have any electricity in our yeah. So yeah. it was a hand and food. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I had it yeah. And uh, I found out that one of my neighbors had it. And uh, I wanted it back. And she said, no, I'm not going to give it back to you. So I had to take it to court. Uh, so the, the, the one of the reasons they didn't like me, they didn't like to see us survive because they were afraid they had to give up back mm -hmm. uh, stolen properties. And the other thing is they were just plain anti-Semitic. They didn't like Jews yet. Um, do you still know the friend that you escaped in the horse and buggy with? Say that again. Um, the friend Lada. that you escaped with in the, in the buggy, in the horse, do you still know him? Yes, in fact, uh, the good questions do I still know him? Yeah. yeah, one of my uh, friends who I lived through this area and who say we uh, he was stuck in the Soviet Union. Uh, for another 40 years, and he now lives in Brooklyn. And uh, another one lives in Israel. You know, we're still uh, very much in touch. Yeah? Um, what did you do when you got to America, like, for a living? What did you do when you got to America for a living? When I came to America? Yeah, good job. Mm -hmm. Well, I learned, uh, I had a trade. I learned, uh, as I mentioned before, in Budapest, I learned how to design and make ladies' handbag, leather handbags. And when I arrived in uh, London, I, uh, at first I was just learning English. Uh, and then I got a job uh, continuing in the same profession. And uh, when I came to America, at first I also worked in that profession, but uh, I decided to change my profession to something else. Linda, has a question? No. Um, you were separated from your siblings at various times. How did you manage to keep track of each other and continue to communicate with each other? Well, I left home in uh, 1942 when I was 14 years old. Uh, by the way, I look at 14-year-olds today and I, I said, how could I, how could I have done it? I, I can't believe I did it. And it's basically to go to a foreign country, too, because I went from what was Czechoslovakia to Budapest, Hungary. And I can't understand how I, how I could have done it. Uh, so until 1944, uh, my family was still, was still in that village, so we, we kept in touch uh, by mail. There were no phones or anything like that. Uh, I, after I, didn't, I, I knew my sister because went to America, and uh, I didn't expect anybody else to survive, but my brother did show up uh, a little later. My sister was in America, and uh, I started to check on her with the Red Cross, the National Red Cross, and also my mother I had three sisters who lived in America, who came here in the 19, when they were teenagers in the 1920s. And uh, my mother used to correspond with them, and I, I had a very good handwriting. I used to address the envelopes. 
And I remembered one of my aunt's addresses. So I, I wrote to them and found out where my sister was. And that's how it is. Because the aunt had to sponsor the sister, right, in order to yes. bring her to yeah. the United States. Any more questions? Okay. What should we say to Mr. Blaine? Thank you. Yeladim. Shalom Kita Alef. Shalom Hamura Orani. Maslom Chema Yom. טוב, תודה, ברוך השם. מי רוצה להגיד לי למה מתפללים? Why do we pray? למה מתפללים להשם? כן, מרים. Can you say it again out loud? It's very complicated. Uh, I like to say I was born in uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, the Soviet Union, and the Ukraine. And uh, I'll explain the uh, place where I was born. And when I was born, was Czechoslovakia. And uh, during World War II, the Hungarians occupied my area. And after uh, the war in 1945, the Soviet Union took that area. And now it's in the Ukraine. So what the joke is that uh, I, my parents were born in Austria-Hungary. I was born in Czechoslovakia.